Hello, and thank you for joining today's session in LHSN's Safer Care Accelerator webinar series. My name is Dee Dee Thompson, and I'm a policy fellow here at Imperial College's Institute for Global Health Innovation, and I lead on the LHSN program, which is a joint initiative with the World Innovation Summit for Health. We're very pleased to be joined by Hannah Patel and Dr. Matthew Harris, who will be discussing the diffusion of innovation in healthcare. I'd like to give our presenters a very brief introduction before we turn the uh, presentation over to them. Hannah Patel is a policy fellow at Imperial College's Institute for Global Health Innovation and has carried out an ongoing piece of research on the global diffusion of healthcare innovation, which investigates the factors which promote and the barriers which inhibit the diffusion of innovations into global health systems. Dr. Matthew Harris is a clinical senior lecturer in public health at Imperial College, jointly appointed between the Department of Primary Care and Public Health and the Institute of Global Health Innovation. His work spans global health, innovation diffusion, primary care, and health services research, and he has worked for several years as a primary care physician in Brazil, as a WHO polio consultant in Ethiopia, and as an HIV technical consultant in Mozambique. Uh, so without further ado, I will go ahead and pass the mic to Matt and Hannah. Thank you very much, Dee Dee. It's a pleasure to join you uh, today to discuss this uh, very complicated and topical issue of diffusion of innovation. Um, what we would like to do today for the next 20 to 25 minutes before opening it up for discussion is to just take you through some of the uh, state of the debate around the innovation diffusion and what some of the uh, literature and research is telling us about how to do it and not to do it and what some of the main challenges are specifically in healthcare. And I think, um, first of all, it's important to say that there has been obviously many, many decades of excellent innovation in healthcare practice and delivery. Um, but one of the main challenges that we've noticed is that it takes on average 17 years for an innovation to get into practice and to be scaled. So really this tells us that whilst we've been very interested in developing innovation, we've not been doing so well at scaling and spreading it. In the last decade, the stream of innovation diffusion literature has really expanded. Um, and I'm going to just take you through some of the different aspects of how we're currently understanding innovation diffusion. Many of you will have already been familiar with this slide, which shows um, Roger's definition of innovation diffusion, classically defined as um, grouping individual people into the innovators, the early adopters, the early majority, late majority, and laggards. But in healthcare, we're increasingly realizing that this um, model, if you like, is considered inadequate in many respects. Um, we find that um, innovation diffusion is not a linear process. Uh, complex organizations in healthcare present enormous uh, difficulties and challenges in change and inertia. We've noticed that different contexts will deliver different results, even with the same innovation implemented in them. We call this the iron law of evaluation. But also, we find that the rate of diffusion of innovations matters when you are thinking about either policy innovation technological innovations or clinical innovations or models of care. Each of these different aspects present different challenges. We need to think a lot about people's what we call innovation budget or their capacity to change and the amount of time and effort it takes to do so. We find in healthcare that um, people, uh, that it's very difficult for healthcare workers to stop and, and change their practice because of the demands of healthcare delivery in day-to-day -day practice. We also find that there's a, um, a lot of interest around the difference between diffusion within an organization, but also diffusion across organizations. I'm sure you'll appreciate that there are very uh, important differences between those um, uh, scenarios. We also are beginning to become much more interested in the role that the private sector can play in diffusing innovations into healthcare. We are understanding more and more that a plethora of different actors are required in the uptake of different technologies in healthcare services. And of course, uh, we can't talk seriously about the diffusion of innovation without also mentioning how social media has recently changed the way that people interact and relate to each other. 
To get to a slightly more semantic issue, perhaps, but one that I think is very important, is that the term diffusion is very problematic. Um, it's been used to describe this uh, question of scaling healthcare technologies and care models, but really it's not a passive or uh, a process um, or necessarily even an active process. It might be neither or it might be both. Really, the adoption of innovations in healthcare is a process of interaction, persuasion, it's an issue of mutually beneficial relationships and resources. Some argue that diffusion and innovation are actually antithetical, that the spread of an innovation is really the opposite of innovating itself, um, which is an interesting part of the literature. But also, we would argue that the word diffusion implies that organizations have a permeable membrane. And really, this is not always the case. It's far more complicated than that. Then there's the question of, is diffusion of innovation, let's call it, a problem at all? We don't actually measure particularly well the uptake of innovations and how they're scaled. So we don't know whether the perceived problem of diffusion of innovation is that um, there is simply a lot of technology that needs to be uh, that has been developed and needs to be pushed out into practice, um, and yet we have perhaps reached at the front line our absorptive capacity for adoption. Some might um, say that we're drinking from a fire hose. So in some senses, the supply of technologies may exceed, well exceed our capacity to adopt them. There's also the question that innovations often by necessity have to change for them to be diffused, for them to be adopted between one context and another. And so as a result, it's difficult to say whether we have a problem with diffusion because the innovations we're talking about may look very different from one context to another. And then there's the uh, question of should we be interested in diffusion also of innovations that are no good? Or are we just interested in the innovations that work? <clears throat> the diffusion of innovation, the, the diffusion of innovation literature is also um, complicated because it comes in many forms. Um, these days, we are seeing a lot of work in other types of literatures that are closely related to the diffusion of innovation literature, such as in implementation science, but also quality improvement, patient safety, and improvement in general. Many authors are beginning to talk about scale-up instead of diffusion. One of the, moving on to some of the challenges around diffusion and adoption, we don't actually know what, the, what level of evidence is required, in what context and for whom, to adopt an innovation. Um, how good is good enough? Um, innovations frequently that are taken up do not necessarily have the evidence to back them up. Um, Evidence-based medicine has definitely been, over the last two decades, uh, supply-side focused, not demand-side focused. And there's certainly an argument to be made that the innovation literature needs to pay more attention to the needs of frontline health workers rather than the, the, the approach of develop an innovation and try and push it out into practice. Some of the things that we talk a lot about in the innovation literature is the not invented here culture. And some of you may have already heard of this. And this is an interesting issue that we'll be speaking about in a bit more detail later on, where the mere fact that the innovation wasn't invented in a particular setting where the frontline health worker operates is a barrier to that adoption. Very clearly, we're understanding that heuristics or mental models and ment mental shortcuts are, in are, are being used to decide what should or shouldn't be adopted. And a lot of work is now being done to understand the um, other aspects of the innovation that are taken into account when a frontline health worker considers it for his or her practice. Clearly, the evidence and the research around innovation spread and diffusion needs to be dynamic and situational, and we need to take into account context. In fact, Tricia Greenhalgh has done an um, excellent uh, piece of work back in 2004 synthesizing all the known literature on diffusion of innovation in healthcare services. Um, and the model of um, uh, the different aspects that are taken into account is far, far more complicated and complex than that which has been considered in Roger's model. 
it really is a question of emergent versus re-engineering approaches, taking into account the characteristics of the innovation itself, whether there's a relative advantage, whether it's compatible with the adopted context, how complex is that innovation? Is it trialable? Is, it, is, is the benefit observable? Does it have fuzzy boundaries? But also taking into account the inner and the outer context of the adopter site. What is the socio-political climate in that context? Is it ready to change? Um, has there been good leadership? Um, is there a vision for change? What are the incentives? And as I've already mentioned, is there an absorptive capacity? Are the people that are going to be using this innovation or technology ready to do so and able to do so? So we're going to um, uh, spend a little bit of time talking about some research that we've been doing on the global diffusion of healthcare innovation, which is a research program funded by the Qatar Foundation um, since 2012 that we here at the Institute of Global Health Innovation have been conducting. Um, in um, very much in the international context. And I'm going to pass over now to Hannah, who's going to describe um, some of the recent work that we've been doing in this space. Thanks very much, Matt. So, as Matt said, this is a piece of research we've been doing here at IGHI um, with the support of the Catholic Foundation since 2012. The first element of research, which involved a number of interviews with, uh, sorry, a number of interviews with experts in this field, involves the creation of the framework that you can see in front of you now. There are three different elements of this framework. First of which, there are the enablers. These are facilitating factors that can be present at multiple levels within a healthcare system. These are high-level factors such as vision, financial incentives, ICT infrastructure, um, and the others which you can see before you. We were interested in how these interact with frontline behaviors. These are actions, both personal and organizational, that are essential for the rapid diffusion of innovation. These can be described more as soft skills and involve things like patient engagement. Delayering, which is the term we like to use, which describes the elimination of old and less effective ways of working. And the simple matter of creating time and space within the workspace for learning about these new innovations and creating time to implement them in your day-to-day -day jobs. At the bottom, you can see the cross-cutting um, factor, which is the healthcare system characteristics. So these are macro-level influences, such as the economic, political, and research environment. And how do these macro-level influences affect the diffusion um, environment? This framework was created, as I said, on the back of a number of interviews. And therefore, GDHI in 2013 was very much focused on validating this framework. Um, assessing the importance of these enablers and frontline behaviors by a number of different people from around the world. As Matt already uh, described, it simply takes too long for new ideas, new innovations to become part of day-to-day -day practice. So the first GDHI, which is a global study, wanted to assess the importance and prevalence of the aforementioned framework in eight countries from around the world, namely Australia, Brazil, England, India, Qatar, South Africa, Spain, and the United States. In partnership with Ipsos Mori, we conducted a uh, study involving 100 quantitative interviews of experts and over 1,500 quantitative surveys, which were carried out by both, uh, sorry, 1,500 with healthcare professionals and 750 surveys were carried out by industry professionals, people from the pharmaceutical industry, for example. And what we were asking them to do is assess the relative importance and prevalence of each of the enablers and the frontline behaviors. On top of this, we carried out our own research looking into the macro level system characteristics and assessed their impact on the perception of the enablers and the frontline behaviors. And as this um, figure shows, that despite differences in enablers across the different countries, there are, sorry, there are certainly common frontline behaviors, namely the, the blue and the green ones, which are linked to addressing the concerns of healthcare professionals about outcomes and sustainability, uh, identifying and supporting champions to embrace and promote change, and harnessing the efforts of patients and the public as co-producers of well-being. It was great to see such a consensus across a range of countries with different economic climates, political climates, and research priorities. However, what we did find was that there is a gap between what people think is important and how prevalent it is in their health system. This doesn't seem that surprising, 
because often we feel that we work in environments where there are shortcomings of what we would want and hope for. However, it really highlights the need to try and close that gap between what people want in their workplace and what is, in fact, prevalent. And in terms of the cultural dynamics, the frontline behaviours that we um, have previously identified um, as aiding the diffusion at the front line, the three most prevalent were adapting the innovation to suit the local context, the creating the time and space for learning and new ways of working, new ways of working, and delayering, which I already described about eliminating the old and ineffective ways of working. What we found was that the, those involved in the study certainly felt that the framework covered the areas that they thought were important to them and that there were some similarities across the eight countries studied um, and that most importantly there was a gap between what was important and what was prevalent. This is insightful but we thought we'd take it one step further in 2015 to better understand specific examples of how elements of the framework had been useful in examples of the rapid diffusion of innovation. So in 2015, we took a look at eight successful examples of the rapid innovation diffusion from around the world. These were identified using a horizon scanning exercise of previously proven successful diffusions of innovation. So as you can see from this map, we chose a variety of countries and a variety of different innovations ranging from policies, practices, and products. We looked at Team Steps, which is a patient safety innovation focusing on teamwork and communication in the USA. We looked at the health insurance exchanges, which were created on the back of the Affordable Care Act, with specific reference to a health insurance exchange in Rhode Island. Then in South America, we focused on the rollout of an HPV vaccination program, as it uh, successfully covered young women across the country in a very short period of time. We moved over to Africa, where we looked at Program WANA, an M Health innovation which improved access to HIV and AIDS results in rural communities in Southern Africa. We looked at the successful rollout of PACS in England, which is a, a technology used for viewing radio, uh, x-rays and other images, and its rapid rollout in England. Then uh, the other European example was Vision Zero, which is a road traffic safety policy aiming to reduce all traffic incidents to zero by 2020. In Nepal, we looked at the National Vitamin A Programme, another distribution innovation, looking at getting vitamin A, um, uh, access to vitamin A improvement in children across the country. And then we looked at integrated care models in Singapore. And what we wanted to do is, using case study methodology, better understand whether elements of the framework had been utilised in the rapid diffusion and implementation of these eight innovations. As you can see from this slide, the findings differed from those reported in the 2013 study. In examples of successful rollout of innovations, they had different levels of importance for each of the um, enablers than, than in 2013. It's important to consider that these we're speaking to people for whom the rollout of the innovation has already been successful, so it's unsurprising that there would be differences between them. After a long exercise, we compared the uh, level of contribution of each enabler across each of the eight case studies, which was a very interesting exercise. And what we found is there are four critical enablers across each of these case studies. Important also to remember very different um, country settings and very different innovations. And what we found that the four most important ones were vision, strategy, and leadership a clear aim, a clear target to work towards, and a clear need for the innovation. It was also necessary to have a specific organization, program, or initiative to promote the diffusion. These are agencies or bodies that are committed to the implementation of an innovation. It is all very well and good having an idea. Unless somebody or some organization is committed to implementing that innovation, they found that it wouldn't have been so successful. Specific funding for research, development, and diffusion was equally important. Again, this makes sense. Without an inadequate financial resource, it's very hard to successfully implement innovation. And finally, and I think one of the most important, is communication channels and networks across not only healthcare and the industries involved in healthcare, but also with the public. What we, what we found was it's very, very important to create the need for change from the bottom up. If people are calling for improvement and there's identified innovation, then that is more conducive with the successful diffusion of innovation. In terms of the 
uh, frontline behaviors and softer elements of the frameworks which were identified this ties into the one I just mentioned, which was the need to engage the public to create the social demand for innovation. And in addition, as, as founded in the 2013 study as being very important, is making the time and space for learning and adopting new ways of working. I think most people would certainly agree that uh, new ideas and innovations all sound very good, but if you're trying to find time in your day-to-day -day life to upskill yourself, um, it can be challenging unless the people you're working for make it possible to create time and space to adopt these new innovations. What we found as well is, as Matt said, the, the, the body of research in this field is growing and there's a number of people who've been committed to understanding the diffusion of uh, innovation for a number of years. And we wanted to see how it fitted within sort of other change management theories and frameworks that already existed. And here, um, as you can see on the slide in front of you, is a, a well-known um, pathway which uh, translates you from innovation to transformation, made up of three phases. And the final part of our study in 2015 was a mapping exercise, linking the elements of the framework which we've already tested to a pre-existing change management model. As you can see from this slide, we felt that the different enablers had, uh, were required at different, different phases and had different priorities at different times. The same can be said for the frontline front behaviors. We hope that this slide shows that our framework is very versatile and can interact with pre-existing research in this field. So WISH 2013 and WISH 2015 allowed us to begin our understanding of the diffusion of innovation and test our framework. Um, both theoretically through interviews as well as through case study research. Um, we continue to take this research forward into 2016, and this time we had more of a focus on where we identify innovations, where are we looking for new ways of working. Thanks, Anna. And on that issue, what we've been become interested in is um, the fact that very disruptive innovations, innovations that are particularly exciting, often have their roots in understanding industries that are actually very different to healthcare. I'm just going to take you through a few exciting examples that some of you may already be familiar with. Um, in 2006, uh, doctors from Great Ormond Street visited and observed the pit crew handoff in Italy, noting the value of process mapping, process description, and trying to work out what people's tasks should be. And following their trip, the Great Ormond Street team videotaped the handover in the surgery unit and sent it to be reviewed by the Formula One team that they had visited. From the analysis came a new handover protocol with more sophisticated procedures and better choreographed teamwork. The Great Ormond Street uh, Hospital researchers also noted the importance of the role of the so-called lollipop man, the one who waves the car in and out and coordinates the pit stop. Under the new handover process, the anaesthetist was given overall responsibility for coordinating the team until it was transferred to the intensive care doctor at the termination of the handover. This is an interesting example of, of how Formula One techniques have been applied in uh, pediatric intensive care. In the Birmingham Children's Hospital, it's also been applied, where real-time adaptive and predictive indicator of deterioration study uses wireless technology taking inspiration again from the Formula One industry to collect, to continuously collect data from patients such as heart rate, breathing rate, oxygen levels, and has revolutionized how patients are monitored to identify much earlier on signs of deterioration. Another example is the Aravind eye care system from India. Um, Aravind has used um, organizations such as McDonald's as their operational model and addresses its goals by strict attention to cost optimization. It's established a manufacturing operation called Auralab to provide lenses and other supplies at a very, very low cost. And Aravind can, can now be considered, in fact, a mass service or service factory as it focuses on a reduced portfolio of specialized services performed in large volume following a quasi-assembly line process. The integration of the facilities and support systems have ensured that a surgeon in India can perform 2,000 surgeries per year against the global average of only around 500. Surgeons perform six to eight cataract operations per hour on an assembly line basis with the support of mid-level trained ophthalmic personnel. 
The next example is that from the aviation industry. Some of you, again, may be familiar with the WHO Surgical Safety Checklist. This was inspired from the aviation industry and the multiple and comprehensive checks that pilots have to undergo at, um, um, before takeoff and after, take and after landing. The use of the surgical safety checklist has found that whilst death rates was 1.4% before the checklist was introduced, it declined to 0.8% afterwards, and this was very statistically significant. Another um, example of um, interesting sources, if you like, of innovation is that of low-income countries. We've become aware of many interesting, frugal, we call them, innovations that could well be of value and use in even high-income country settings. Here's one example from the orthopedic industry. The Arbutus drill has been, um, has been used in orthopedic surgery in a very interesting way. We know that 5 billion people around the world do not have access to safe surgery. And in many of these contexts, it's not feasible to purchase a commercial drill that is sterilizable and reusable um, at a cost of often upwards of $30,000 each. In countries like Malawi, They've been using a sterilizable patent pending bag that enables the drill, which can be a much more simple um, drill even for use in the home, uh, can be reused in, under sterilizable conditions in the operating theater to exactly the same effect. And to date, this drill cover has been used in over 4,000 surgeries in low resource settings and emergency relief. Another example is that of using mosquito net mesh to repair hernias. Again, in some countries in Africa, um, commercial mesh for use in hernia operations is not feasible, costing over $100 per, um, per use. Um, in a study in the New England Journal of Medicine in January 2016, a randomized controlled clinical trial shows that the use of mosquito net mesh, which is obviously much more common in those contexts, at a cost of only 0.25 cents per patch, was used um, on, a, on 302 patients in the study and found no significant difference in post-operative complications or recurrence of hernia compared to the commercial net. So, uh, so clearly a very interesting saving, a very exciting example of frugal innovations. So we, we've explored in the last iteration of the global diffusion of healthcare innovation, to what extent are frontline health workers looking outside of their own clinical specialty um, to source ideas for improving their healthcare delivery. We've also been looking at the extent to which they look at low-income countries. And our research has shown that in the vast majority of cases, um, the frontline health workers are in fact drawing ideas from their own clinical specialty. We interviewed uh, just last year nearly 1,300 frontline health workers from six different countries, similar to the first GDHI study um, in Brazil, the US, England, Tanzania, India, and Qatar. And we found across the board that 85% of them, when, they, when we asked them where did their in the last 12 months, where did an idea to improve clinical care come from, in their experience? Um, in 85% of the uh, cases, it came from their own clinical specialty. In only 5% of cases did it come from a, a, an industry unrelated to healthcare. We also asked, where did that idea come from? And 45% of our respondents indicated it came from their own organizations. I, um, within um, either their organization where they work or an organization close to them in their locality. Only 11% of respondents noted that the idea that they were trying to implement in clinical practice had come from outside of their own country. Really, this um, we, we then ask um, which kinds of country um, tend to be the most common sources of inspiration, shall we say, um, for improving healthcare practice for frontline health workers in these six countries. And this touches on um, a subject area that's growing of late in the literature called reverse innovation, which some of you may have heard of. And that's the specific um, aim to improve um, or increase the adoption of frugal lean innovations that have been developed in and developed by 
low income countries, um, adopting them into high income country contexts. And of course, the reason for that is that on the one hand, low income countries have been doing a lot more with a lot less for a lot longer. And as a result, have increasingly been developing interesting frugal innovations uh, to cope with the demands on their healthcare system. But also in high income settings, such as in England or the US, struggling under resource constraints in many respects, growing demand on healthcare services, we would do well to adopt some of the innovations from those settings. Um, however, we noticed in our study that only 25% of those that were interviewed noted um, in the top three countries that they suggested were useful sources of innovation, only 25% noted a low-income country at all in that top three. Um, if we look at the uh, overall distribution of the types of countries that are noted to be of value um, in terms of um, new and interesting innovations that are considered to be appropriate for their own home context, we see some interesting patterns from this study. Significantly more countries are noted to be high income compared to low and middle income country, and perhaps that might not be as a surprise to some of you. However, when we look at purely the responses from the English frontline health workers, we notice that there are virtually no low or middle income, uh, low middle income or low income countries considered to be of value in terms of sources of innovation. A very different picture to the responses from colleagues from Tanzania. So there's some interesting questions here around um, what, on what basis do we consider innovations to be transferable from one country to the next. And this really tucks into some of the socio-cultural perspectives on diffusion of innovation that we've been working on. Um, and very clearly we're, we're finding that there, it's a bit of a black box. We don't really know very clearly what it is that, um, that people are considering when they consider that innovations from one context are or aren't relevant or appropriate for their own. In many respects, there's a tendency for, uh, for example, um, frontline health workers from the UK to identify predominantly rich OECD countries as sources of innovation, when in actual fact, many of the con those countries are so dissimilar in terms of the micro level granularity of uh, the health system that in fact that's actually a mistake to look to those countries for their innovations. And this quote shows when we were asking some uh, policymakers from the United States, this interesting quote that, well, theoretically, ideas from Ghana could actually be more relevant than ideas from the UK, but that's not how the learning works. And that's the cultural arrogance piece of the post-colonial legacy that I think interferes. So there's some really, the next steps in the debate are really to understand how do people make decisions about what to adopt and what not to adopt. Um, some other areas of interesting research are around the value of international health partnerships. These are vehicles potentially for bringing ideas across boundaries and across national, national um, boundaries and national contexts. Particularly here in the UK, we have a, a variety of international health partnerships between NHS organizations and lower middle income countries. And so these clearly could potentially be a valuable resource for bringing ideas back into the NHS. But we do find that there's a lot to learn from other literatures, for example, in the marketing literature, that um, certainly with applied to healthcare, we would do well to understand how some of these decisions of adoption are made. I often use this example. Um, if you were to look at this watch and, and imagine its value and its price and its quality, uh, where, what kind of shop you might buy it in and how well or, or not it might work, and then if you imagine this watch, did at any moment that any of those characteristics change for you in your mind, really what, this is, what is happening here has been well known for decades in the marketing literature, that the source of a product interferes with how we rate it, um, even though the product may be completely identical in all respects. And what we don't know in the diffusion literature in healthcare is how is this important in the spread and scale of different innovations. And just to give you an example of how this plays out in a slightly pervasive, um, subtle way, that randomized controlled trial I mentioned about the uh, hernia repair using mosquito net mesh that showed no difference between 
um, using mosquito net mesh and commercial, expensive commercial mesh, the conclusions of the report, interestingly enough, suggest that therefore that mosquito net mesh should only be used in resource poor settings. And we would argue that increasingly we need to also consider those low cost innovations for our own high income settings as well. Just as our last slide, um, we've done a fair bit of work also looking at particular new types of organizations called, that we call curator organizations that have a very important role in the diffusion process because these organizations um, are often private, not-for-profit uh, organizations, uh, research organizations that create innovation databases of under-the-radar innovations from around the world, agnostic, if you like, to which countries they come from, and yet can provide a very useful repository of knowledge and sources of ideas for health systems to learn from. Organizations such as CHMI, the Centre for Health Market Innovation, the World Innovation Summit for Health Innovation Showcases, uh, Duke University's Institute um, in uh, Innovations in Healthcare, are all um, becoming increasingly involved in the identification and curation of innovations that should be adopted in practice. And this is a very interesting challenge to overcome um, the problem with uh, under the radar innovations where not necessarily there's an evidence base particularly well developed for their effectiveness, but that address healthcare needs both for the patient, the professional, and the system as a whole. So in summary, uh, what we've tried to address in discussing the state of the debate around the diffusion of innovation issue is that diffusion is not a passive process. There's pull and push factors. Both are important. One needs to consider the inner and the outer context of the adopter organization, as well as the characteristics of the innovation itself but also that spread is a social, cultural, and very messy process. Often, the really creative solutions to healthcare have been found by looking outside the box, but we found that it's not common practice to do so. A particular note is that low-middle-income countries are undervalued as sources of innovation, and that curator organizations can play a useful role in, in enabling the spread of innovations from one context to another. So just to say thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. And we open the floor to any discussion. Great. Well, thank you both so much for that very interesting presentation. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions. So we'd like to open the floor to any questions from the audience, but also um, really encourage you to chime in with any thoughts that you might have, either um, examples from your own organization of innovations that have worked particularly well, or how the uh, framework might be applicable to your setting. So please feel free to type those in um, or use the rain, raise hand function if you'd like to speak live. I see we have our first question from David Grayson, who we uh, very much thank for joining us in New Zealand at who knows what hour. Um, but his question is, may we see increased uptake of innovation with the increased use of social media in healthcare? Thank you, David. I think that's a very important question. And um, it, yes, I think we probably can, um, because the democratization of knowledge that the internet is, is doing is leading to issues that we're grappling with all over the world, not just on innovation, um, is certainly going to expedite that spread of knowledge uh, from, uh, uh, from into, into different contexts. What we don't know is what kind of innovation social media necessarily is going to help the spread of. The, uh, as I described earlier, there's very different challenges around the um, uptake of specific technologies versus care models and service delivery design. Um, so each of those present very, very different and unique challenges. So whilst I think social media is a very important vehicle, um, it remains to be seen for, for which types of innovation. And uh, next question, and I realize this is maybe a bit reductive given um, what you've been speaking about throughout, but is there one innovation that you've seen that really works that you could point to? I think both Matt and I have spent a lot of time um, conducting horizon scanning exercises using the affirmation, uh, aforementioned curator organizations, um, et cetera, and there's a huge range of innovations out there that seem to have a lot of potential um, and are being implemented around the world from sort of high-cost innovations such as the da Vinci robots that are in use in some uh, 
uh, developed countries all the way through to frugal innovations such as the Arbus drill cover. For me, uh, the most convincing innovations uh, and the most impactful are still some of the more behavioral change innovations. Simple things such as hand washing, its role in infection control and health outcomes for patients, um, for me, are still some of the most impactful innovations. Not to belittle the tech um, <laughs> and social media and some of the more complex innovations, but uh, especially as we move towards a climate of non-communicable disease, which is linked to behaviors, I think uh, behavioral innovations such as hand washing are very, very important. And building on that a bit and uh, looking forward to the future, over the next 20 years, let's say, um, which area of healthcare do you think has the most potential for innovation, um, both in terms of feasibility as well as where that need will be? I think I sort of echo my previous sentiment around moving away from high cost technical and technological innovation and moving towards the more frugal, low cost innovation. We've got um, aging populations around the world and a number of people grappling with long-term chronic disease and end-of-life questions uh, being cared for outside of the hospital and in the community. So I think innovation is focusing on end-of-life care and access to health care in, in your old age, such as telemedicine. Uh, there are some positive examples uh, in uh, Singapore, which we have studied, uh, for example, called Jerry Care, but sort of accessing those populations in a sort of low-cost, uh, high-reach uh, way would be, I think, an area of interest. And I, and I would add that over the next 20 years, I think also we need to innovate in the process of innovation. So the way that the, the current model of research and development and pushing technologies out into practice and hoping somehow someone will, will find a market for them is, is clearly not working. Some of the other work that we do here at Imperial College, particularly with the Helix Center at St. Mary's Hospital, is on the issue of co-design. And that's something where, the, um, where designers, clinicians, patients and managers simultaneously contribute to the design and development of particular um, innovations. And so therefore there is buy-in from the very beginning of the design stage that supports the um, adoption and implementation and scaling of that particular product. So I think um, there's a lot of work to be done in the next 20 years about how to um, create the processes such that that type of co-development, co-design innovation process is more common practice. Great. Well, I realize we're um, bumping up on our time now. So just um, finally, as a, a closing question, either to one or both of you, or you can jointly answer it, um, what are the two or three key takeaways that you would like the audience to walk away with, or really just any closing statements that you might have? Well, thank you, Didi. I would say that um, one of the takeaways is that uh, innovating is very complicated in healthcare. It's not a there isn't a um, uh, easy recipe or menu to follow. Um, it's all about people and about communication and understanding the need as well as the supply of, of solutions. Um, I think uh, the takeaway, therefore, is to um, really understand this complexity. Um, but to also never stop trying to change clinical practice. It sometimes can take a very long time. <laughs> Certainly, there's a lot of things that make innovating in healthcare very different to innovating in, in other industries. But um, our three years of research has certainly highlighted the importance of research in this field. There's a real desire from those working as managers and clinicians in the, in the system to innovate, but also to better understand how they can innovate successfully. Um, both in terms of identifying those innovations and implementing them. So I do hope that the research we've done here at Imperial can uh, contribute towards bettering the outcomes in this area. Thank you very much. Great. Well, I think we will end there, but wanted to um, say another thank you very much to both of our presenters for taking the time to speak with us today, as well as to all of you in the audience for listening. Uh, we'll also be posting a recording of the webinar to the LHSN website, which is www.leadinghealthsystemsnetwork.org. So please feel free to uh, share that link with any colleagues that might have missed the live broadcast. And thank everyone again for joining and hope you have a great rest of the week. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.